Jesus may possess the answers that we seek, but he also asks the questions we need to hear. Let's get close enough to listen to his wisdom and also be ready with our answer when the Jesus question comes our way. Good to be together. Greetings. Welcome. I'm Nathan, one of the pastors here. Hello to everybody joining us at any of our campuses, joining us online, watching this later, wherever you are. It's, uh, it's good to be here. And uh, we're just going to dive right into this Jesus question series. I want to start with a question from me. Uh, right, were you here last weekend? Yeah, or maybe you weren't, but you heard that God did uh, just an amazing thing among us at all of our campuses. We we were asking or allowing Jesus to ask us this really important question where he says, who do you say that I am? And offered the opportunity for all of us, maybe the first time or maybe for the thousandth time to say, to answer along with Peter uh, with these great old words, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, which means the, the Messiah of God, the long awaited and foretold prophet, priest, king, the holy one. I believe that he, that's who he is. He's the son of the living God. He's my Lord and my Savior. And a lot of people uh, responded and were invited and took up uh, the offer and the opportunity right there in the service to take the really important step of baptism. And um, so it was just an amazing time together. And uh, a little recap video has been prepared. So let's take a look at that. Such, such a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I was thinking about 226 dunks in one weekend. I was thinking about March Madness, but that was even better, right? Uh, it's just, Christian baptism is such a beautiful thing. It, it's, I know God is at a part of it partly because it kind of looks the same every time. It's kind of the same, but every single time, it's so beautiful and so powerful. And so I was just thinking, we were thinking, uh, there may be some people who weren't here last weekend who didn't get that opportunity or hear that invitation, or maybe you were, and you kind of got this close but didn't quite take that step. Uh, maybe you wanted to think about it or pray about it a little bit more. Maybe you just kind of kind of chickened out. Whatever it was, the offer, the question from Jesus, and the invitation, they still stand today. So if today's the day that you need to take that really important faith step of baptism, do it. Find your way to up front after the service where you're, where you're hearing this message or um, find one of the pastors, one of the leaders, and let's get it done today. And this could be your day. And you can be baptized any week, any weekend uh, here at any of our mountain campuses. So just know that as we now dive into this week's Jesus question. And before we, uh, before we get to it, let me just set the scene a little bit. We're, we're in Luke chapter 6, okay? That's uh, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So if you go about that far in your Bible, about five-sixths of the way in, uh, you'll find Luke chapter 6. And um, Jesus has been going around doing his thing. He's been healing people, like, left and right. He's been taking heat from religious leaders who are upset about what he's doing and the way he's doing it. He has been doing a lot of teaching, okay, and some very challenging teaching in, uh, in this section, uh, he's been teaching about loving your enemies. He's been teaching about not judging each other and, and kind of looking at your own sin before you ever even think about talking to someone else about their sin. And then, kind of in the middle of all that, very abruptly, 
he just comes out with this question and just drops it on his followers. He looks at his disciples and says, hey, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? He's like, you know, Lord, authority, boss, leader, right? Um, You're saying that I'm your Lord, but you're not actually behaving as if it's true. Why? Why is that? Am I your Lord or not? It's just like, boom, there it is. And I was thinking about how he did this and, and, you know, who Jesus is and all this. And I realized, I think I have used this technique before with my daughters, okay? I never really made the kind of the Jesus connection before, but um, here's what, what has happened before. I have two, two daughters, and you, you're not going to believe this, but there's been times when my wife Erin and I have asked them or told them to do something, and they have not done it. <laughs> they, have, they have chosen not to do what we said, and in those moments, you know, we've tried different techniques. We repeat ourselves, we raise our voice, we do use whatever other techniques are available to us. Sometimes it still doesn't work. And what I realize I have done at times is I've just kind of stopped and whatever daughter we're talking about, I got kind of gotten on her level and said, hey, do you, do you trust me? Like, do you think I'm, I'm a, actually a good dad? Do you respect me? And like know that I love you and this thing I'm asking you to do, I have your best interest in mind. Do you think maybe, do you trust and believe that I actually have some life experience that you don't have yet? And I have your best interest in mind and this thing I'm asking you to do is is for a good reason? And when I've done that, the answer in one form or fashion has always come back, yes, dad, yes, And then I say, okay, so help me understand. Tell me why you are choosing not to do what I'm asking you to do. Tell me about, explain that to me. And as best I can recall, this technique has often worked, okay? It it often comes with like noises like, uh, you know, or, or like facial expressions or whatever. But it seems to work. And I think that's what Jesus was doing right here. I, I wanted to stop right up front here and sort of say, as we go through this series, I would like to challenge each of us to think about how it is that we hear Jesus asking us these questions. Use your imagination a little bit. What, what, is, uh, what does his face look like? What's in his eyes? Is he angry? Is he kind of glaring at you? Is he aloof, you know, uninterested? Uh, what's his voice like when you hear Jesus asking you these questions? Is it loud? Is it quiet? Is it strong or weak? Or is he shouting from, like, are you straining to hear him because he's He's way off in the distance. As he's looking straight at you, what's his tone? Think about this too. Do you, ask yourself, do I, because of my story and my history with authoritative voices in my life, do I add other words in there? Like when, instead of, you know, who do you say that I am? Do I hear, do I actually hear, hey, dummy, who do you say that I am? Instead of, what are you so afraid of, do I hear, Jesus say, what are you so afraid of? Not that anybody actually cares what you have to say. I just think we need to think about that. And this question in particular, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say, is, is maybe even more uh, kind of open, lends itself to these sort of negative interpretations based on some of our issues with parents and authority figures in our past. Maybe what we hear this week is something like, hey, what is wrong with you? Why, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Are you stupid or something? Or, or however, however you might hear it, I just want to say, if it's, if it's in, along those lines, I want to very clearly and strongly say, I don't think that's the tone that Jesus is using here. I don't think uh, that's the case because neither the context of the scripture nor the character of Jesus would suggest that. I think Instead, I picture Jesus asking his disciples this question with great kindness and and just loving, genuine care. I don't think he's trying to belittle us, maybe as others have done to you. I don't think this is a scolding situation. Jesus uh, definitely got angry sometimes, but there's no implication here that, that he's angry in this moment. What I think is happening here with this question, the Jesus question this week, is this a very practical teaching moment from the best and kindest and most loving teacher that there's ever been. So Jesus, he just asked them this question. And then, interestingly, 
Uh, he doesn't wait for an answer. So Jesus, he asked a lot of questions. Another thing he did was he told a lot of stories. So right here, he asks a question and launches right into a story that I, I think he sees as helping each of us to come up with our answer to his question. So before I read the story, I just want to ask you a couple more questions. One, think about your answer to this. What is the most important part of a house? Okay, think about your house. Think about whatever house you want to think about. Is the kitchen is the living room, the bedroom, the bathroom, the, the roof, the walls, the doors, the windows, the, the heating and air. Think about your answer. And if you get it right, when I tell you the correct answer in a minute, you get free coffee at every mountain service that you ever come to, okay? Next question. Look at these two houses. Which one would you rather have? I'm gonna give you one of these two houses. Which one would you rather have? This is a beautiful home. Looks like it's probably three, 4,000 square feet multiple levels. This is a little cabin. It's maybe 10 by 10, one room, okay? Which one would you rather have? All right, now listen to this story. <clears throat> Luke 6 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you all what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. Some translations say solid rock or bedrock. When the flood came, when the flood came, the torrent, the storm, struck the house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. Sometimes it says like on the sand. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Sometimes it'll say things like, it was utterly destroyed. All right, now you know the answer to the first question. What's the most important part of a house? The foundation. Okay, now I want you to take a look at these images unedited and tell me which house you want. This beautiful house is sinking into the ground because it's built on a lousy foundation. This little cabin is small, but it's built on a solid rock. You see, the foundation is the thing, right? If you've ever, you know, sh shout amen or groan or something, if you've ever had foundation issues with your house, right, you know it's a nightmare. Even if you haven't gone through that, uh, you've seen, if you watch Chip and Joanna or whatever, you know, what's the worst news they can get? about a house that they've bought. Yeah, you know, there's a problem with the foundation. Oh, no. I got to thinking about um, when I was a freshman in college, uh, some changes, of course, in my life in some ways. I chose to use my spring break to go on a mission trip, house building trip to Mexico. And I've been back, I think, 11 times to help build houses with this great organization called Casas por Cristo, Houses for Christ, or Houses Through Christ. And it's interesting uh, they work with local churches. They find families that need a home that are living in basically tacked together pallets and whatnot. It's, and, uh, and we help them build a house in three days, okay? And the first day you show up and it kind of looks like this. There's a flat spot and you start building, you know, a wood frame and that's what it looks like at the beginning. At the, at the end of the first day, it looks like this. Not much different. The only thing that's different is this concrete slab, Okay. Uh, at the end of day two, something like that. At the end of day three, something like that, okay? So I just got to thinking about, now, there are some other things going on off to the side on day one, framing up some walls, and, but disproportionately, the, the foundation, not even to mention all the site work that's been done before we even arrived, the foundation takes up a huge part of the time and energy. I just think about how at the end of day one, it looks like we haven't even really done much, but we have. We worked the same amount each of those days. The foundation is just incredibly important. So Jesus asked this question. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Then he tells this story, and then end of chapter, end of teaching, on to some other stuff in the book of Luke. And there's so much we can get out of this question and this story, but I want to draw out a couple things for us today. And the first one is just this. It's so binary. It's so either or, black and white, one or the other. 
This is not uncommon in the teachings of Jesus. There's this kind of stuff sprinkled throughout. He talks about sheep, sheep and goats, you know, or, or with me, against me, from heaven or from men, from humans, right? Um, even right here in Luke chapter 6, he's already done some of this. He talks about, you know, what's, what is right to do on the Sabbath, good or evil, save life or destroy it. He talks about good fruit, bad fruit, good tree, bad tree, no in between, one or the other. So think about this. If, you're, if you are a student or take yourself back to the days when you were a student, let's say we're gonna, I'm going to give you a test, and there's three different kinds of tests I could give. Uh, multiple choice, uh, true, false, or essay, okay? I want you to think about which one you prefer. Raise your hand if you would prefer the essay test, essay questions, okay? It's always just a few. Uh, raise your hand if you would prefer multiple choice, yeah? And then what about true, false? Yeah. What I'm saying here is this story and this question from Jesus, you true false people are, might, might like it a little more. It would make more sense to you. And the essay question people might struggle with it a little more because he's, he's saying true false, this or that. Think about this story. There's a lot of things that the, you know, the wise builder and the foolish builder they have in common. There's a lot of things that are the same in the story. If we like sort of graph it out, they hear the same message from the same Jesus right? Uh, they build the same house. They both build their house. They, uh, they face the same storms. The storms in the story is just a metaphor for life, right? And li I don't have to even use any sermon time to talk about how hard life is. We know that. I'm just going to say John 16, Jesus said one time, he said, in this life, you will have trouble. The story says when the storm came, not if. But then he says, take heart because I have overcome the world. If anybody, if any of you 226 people who got baptized or anybody else got told, hey, become a Christian and your life will get easier, I, I'm sorry to inform you that you have been misled. Life is hard for both, okay? But here, there are two parts of this story that are very, very different for these two builders, right? The first one is just this. Where do they build their house? What's the foundation? And the second part is the result. The end result says, one, the wise builder, that house is going to stand through the storm, all the storms. But the other house is going to fall with a great, great crash. So there's this implied follow-up Jesus question, which says this, all right, which one are you? Which one are you? Life is, can be so complex sometimes. We have more and more choices uh, and it stresses us out, you know, life is, life is complicated. And even though this is a very in-your-face question from Jesus, I sort of find it refreshing, just the simplicity of it. It's binary. It's true, false. It's yes, no. It's, he says, me or not me, right? Um, in faith, in doctrine, in, in theology, religion, Sometimes some of this stuff is, is very much essay question territory. It's complex. It's confusing. Uh, there's parts of our life of faith that, um, that definitely are not true, false, right? Uh, I've had conversations in classes ad nauseum on theology, Christology, pneumatology, missiology, ecclesiology, soteriology, eschatology, hamartiology, okay? We can, we can get into that stuff. But what I love about here, this question today and last week as well is Jesus presents the core issue of the Christian faith in a way that is so simple and so clear. A child can be asked this question and expected to understand it and to react and respond to it. There's no need for a seminary degree. Jesus says, are you with me or not? Am I your Lord or not? To use the words from that great film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Is y'all is or is y'all ain't my disciples? That's the question. And it's actually very serious business. What he is talking about here is everything. He's talking about your life, your eternal life. What Jesus, what we are talking about here is heaven and hell. That's, that's kind of uncomfortable, right? 
but it's real. And we could sit here and debate how much we do and don't and should and shouldn't get up here in, from the pulpit and, you know, try to scare the hell out of people. And Jesus talked about it. But one of the, one of the things that's just clearly true is that Jesus had this question for every human being, where and how do you want to spend your eternal life? Do you want to spend it in heaven, which is just the loving and good and eternal presence of God, or in hell, which is the eternal absence and separation and rejection of God? I was as interesting in my studies for this, I came across one, one thing, that, uh, one guy that said, you know, the word originally constituted the, for hell is something that means, its primary meaning was something very similar to the words Jesus used to describe that second house. It's, it's a word that means utter devastation. It's the total collapse and destruction of a soul. That's heavy stuff. I want you to hold all that in your heart and your mind. Think about this story of Jesus uh, kind of at a, layer, at a layer deeper while you watch this news clip about a crumbling house. When you spend 16 years on the water, you get used to some things. Jim Beggerly is used to good fishing, but better sights. You just don't see that any other place on the lake. But what has happened over the last couple of weeks is hard to ignore. Geologically, there's something different right there. A billion dollar home is starting to buckle. As the bank slowly erodes, the house is separating with it. The pier is getting crunched. That's their aspirations there for their dream house or their retirement house. Now it's literally coming down around their ears. It's what has Paul Keel in his jet ski taking some pictures. I'm, I'm glad it's not my house. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't live far. This is a very exclusive neighborhood around Lake Palestine. They're a whole lot steeper here than where we are. Our, where we're at is uh, gently sloping down. The rains and strong winds haven't been kind to this decade-old home, neither like to the seawall. Landslides have happened before, as you can tell. The ground is saturated. Some of the large, older trees uh, have been falling over. The homeowners have moved out, according to the Homeowners Association. The no trespassing sign is cruel irony. Engineers and the fire department are playing defensive because everyone, including Jim, is waiting to see when it will go. Some pretty powerful lines in there, like, you know, hey, that's, that's their aspirations right there. Also, I checked, they did say billion dollar house, and I'm like, how is that even a thing? Uh, but it's, that, that's their life, that's their investment. Another one he said, he said, uh, I'm glad it's not my house. You know, and then every, everyone's waiting to see it when it will go. I think everybody, like the guy on the jet ski and, and you and me, we watch something like that, we go, we walk away, and one of the things we think is, I need to check my foundation. Where is my house? What's my house built on top of? I watched another video similar to that one where this whole neighborhood in California, big, beautiful homes, the whole neighborhood is just sinking into the ground. They're just falling apart and crumbling. And uh, the news anchor used a phrase that sort of haunted me. He said, it, she called it a slow motion disaster. And I just want you to hear Jesus very clearly today. Jesus saying this, not me. He says, if you're building your house, the house of your life, if you're building your life on anything but him, it may look really nice. But if he is right and he is who he says he is, your life is a slow motion disaster. <coughs> and that is so sad. So, you know, it's tragic enough to watch someone's life savings and their investment fall off the edge of a cliff or into a sinkhole. How much more tragic is it when we're talking about an eternal life, a soul? And to think it can all be avoided if we just choose to build our house on the rock solid foundation of Jesus. The second thing I would want to pull out of this story for us is just the fact that Jesus uses a building metaphor here. You know, Jesus often uses uh, kind of farming or, or nature or, or agrarian like kind of metaphors. He talks about planting seeds and watering and growing and God, you know, doing the work and bringing the, bearing the fruit. 
And uh, we do our part, but God is sort of the locus of control in those stories. But this one is different. He says, a man builds a house. That's something we go and do. It, puts, it centers the action on the person, not Mother Nature, not God, right? But that, I think he does that because this is a story and a question where he is calling and challenging us to obedient action, build. There's a tension in the life of faith between, always will be, between faith and works, right? And, and God's initiative or our own initiative. And it, it's all grace at the end of the day, yes. And God is sovereign over all of it at the end of the day, yes. And our actions and our choices, do they really, really, really matter? Also, yes. Back to that confession, you know, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, right? He's my Lord and my Savior. That word believe, by the time it gets to English, is kind of wimpy. It, it doesn't mean what it originally meant. We think, we hear the word believe, and we think, okay, I've decided in my brain that that's what I believe, right? But the word, think about it more like if faith were a verb. The word pistis in Greek, it always, it is inherently includes action that proves the belief. See what I'm saying? Here's a great, simple definition of faith or belief. Trust in action. Trust that goes so deep as to actually inform and shape my behavior. The proof is in the pudding. Don't tell me, Jesus says, show me. If you are a parent or a teacher or a coach or any kind of a mentor or whatever, you've said this to somebody, right? You've said, hey, I hear what you're saying, but prove it, show me, let's do it, right? And I think this Jesus question this week, it, it wants us each to kind of get on the other side of that question, look in the mirror and say, all right, what, what am I actually living? Those, you know, what beliefs do my actions truly demonstrate? Those 226 folks who got in the water, they believed in their heart, they confessed with their lips, they took a step to get in the water. But my question for all of you and for all of us, baptized last week, baptized now, baptized whenever, here's, a new, here's another Jesus question. What now? Now what? See, here's how we've been trained to think. We tend to think like this. Here is what I believe, okay? This is what I truly believe. Now, this is kind of how I act and live, and it doesn't always line up with this, but that's, you know, this is what I believe. And I just wanna say, I think Jesus, not only Jesus, but common sense, looks at that approach and says, nope. That is a fantasy, right? I could sit here and tell you that, and I could even believe that I'm the starting point guard for the Boston Celtics. But then the actions and the living of my life prove that to be false. I can sit here and tell you that I am working on finishing, installing this new floor in my basement. But with every day that it sits there and it doesn't make any progress, it's just not true. You can sit there and say, Jesus is my Lord, but where are you actually building your life? We tend to think, here's what I believe. You know, my actions don't really line up with it. But the truth is this. Here is what I continually, habitually do. Ergo, this is what I believe. It's proven in the actions. This is a hard word, right? It's not fun to hear, maybe. Uh, and just remember, we have the grace of God covering all of this when we mess up and fail and fall. But I think what Jesus wants to challenge us with today is you gotta own this. You and no one else, you are building your life. I am building my life. And the most important question is where? On what foundation? Jesus makes the audacious claim that he and only he is worthy to be the foundation of a human life. Jesus says, you know what? It's, uh, here's the test. It's true, false, and there's one question, and then there's this huge project you gotta do. True, false, one question, who's your Lord? And here's the project, build a life on that foundation. That great old hymn says, on Christ the solid rock I stand, 
All other ground is sinking sand. All, even the good stuff, career, family, talent, wealth, nation, you know, the list goes on and on. It all adds up to sinking sand if you're trying to make any of that the foundation of your life. Well, this is something we got to deal with. It, it struck me uh, as I was thinking about this, you know who's the only people who are off the hook for this week's Jesus question? Is the people who have never said, Lord, Lord. If you don't call Jesus your Lord, you're off the hook for this question. But you're still on the hook for some other questions like, who do you say that I am? Like, what are you gonna do with this resurrection thing? You know, I love Mark Twain, and he famously said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand. I say amen. So here's the question, what now? And I think we gotta do two things. I think we gotta examine very honestly where we're building our lives. What's the foundation? And then I think we gotta get busy building on the rock, okay? And here's how we do that. Here's just some tools for doing that. One, Bible. Get into it. Learn the story of the people of God. Learn the character of the God who makes this audacious claim that you should build your life on him. Test and approve what is God's will. Prayer, ask and it will be answered, right? Ask, and he will, he, will, he will communicate back with you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Here's another one. Church, community, other people, wise counsel, people to advise you, people to challenge you, people to catch you when you're falling. That's the tried and true stuff. Here's one other tool that I'm going to share with you to help you do these two things, to examine where you're building and to get busy building in the right place, okay? It's just called, I don't know who came up with this, been around forever, it's called Spies. And I have a couple of asterisks there that I'll explain in a minute. Um, this is just a great tool for lots of different kinds of check-ins. I use it in uh, coaching mentoring relationships, I use it in peer relationships, I, we use it in our marriage. And I think it's particularly useful here as we wanna think about where am I building my life and figure out what are some next steps to, to to build in the right place, to build on the rock solid foundation. So I want you to think of these different things maybe as like rooms, important rooms in your house, okay? The first S stands for social. That just means key relationships, friendships. And I wanna ask you, is Jesus the foundation of all your human relationships? What I don't mean is like, are you only friends with a bunch of other Christians or people that believe and think like you do? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, are you doing relationships the way that Jesus did? Do you, yes, have some deep-rooted, faith-based, common faith-based relationships, right? Do you have some of those that are like really important to you? Do you also have lots of missional kind of crossing the boundaries, building bridges, tearing down walls kind of relationships to people that are different than you in all kinds of different ways? Are you open to all the different folks that God might bring into your life and across your path, et cetera. Each of these could be a whole other sermon, but you get what I'm saying. Key relationships. P is for physical, health, diet, exercise, rest, rhythms. Am I caring for my body as if it were the temple of God? If Jesus lives in there, am I a good landlord? I always think about deep thoughts with Jack Handy. He said something like, if Jesus lives inside me, I hope he likes burritos because that's what he's getting or something like that. So go back, I just think about that, it's really important. Go back, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to the messages in a series we did called Everybody Matters. Eyes for intellectual, what am I feeding my mind? This is the content question. What am I consuming? What am I reading, listening to, watching on the many screens in my life? Again, I'm not saying only ever do things that are labeled Christian, like only right now media from here on out, you know, no more Netflix, that's not what I'm saying at all. And I am saying, though, if we need to learn to think and read and watch and listen and observe Christian Lee, we need to, you know, if Jesus is going to be my Lord and my foundation, there better be a lot of, a significant amount of his stuff going in. All Netflix, no Bible, that's sinking sand, right? All Bible and no clue about what's going on in the culture, I would also say, let's talk about how you're actually reading and interpreting and understanding what the Bible has to say. But we have to think about our intellectual lives if we're gonna build on the, on the foundation. 
of Jesus. Uh, e is for emotional. And I would sum this up by just saying, who gets to tell you who you are? What are the voices? Um, this, this one, I just feel like giving a little confession here. This is one where I feel like I've been failing lately for the past year or two of my life. I, I think it's safe to say my, my house, the house of my life is largely, is built on the foundation, on the rock of Jesus. But I'll, I'll tell y'all, for the last year or so, I've been building a little wing off on some sinking sand. I had a little vacation home on some sinking sand of some other voices in my life that were tell, trying to tell me who I am, and it wasn't Jesus' voice primarily. So I want to ask you where you're doing that. To borrow the language from Carlos Whitaker a couple, few weeks ago, what are the spiders you need to go kill? And if the primary voice informing your identity and your emotional life is not Jesus, you are a slow motion disaster building your house on the sinking sand. So get into that and get some help. The next S, and this is the first asterisk, is uh, the word spiritual. I just put the little asterisk there because I think everything's spiritual. All this is spiritual. But what this means is this is your God and me life. Your religious life is a part of this. Your devotional life is a part of this. Your relationship with God. And just you just need to know Jesus, again, very audaciously, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He makes that claim about himself. So are you building your spiritual life on Jesus or on somewhere else or on some kind of other buffet of spiritual ideas? Here's the second asterisk. I will add, I often add one more letter. We'll call it Spife's uh, financial because it's so huge in our lives. Jesus talks about money more than just about any other topic, way more than heaven and hell, for example, way more. And I just want to say there's probably no truer indicator of where you are actually building your life. Your bank statement tells the story of your faith as well, if not better, than your prayer journal does. Sorry, not sorry. This is truth. So if you are calling Jesus Lord, Lord, and not trusting him with your finances, you are probably building your life on some sinking sand. Are you tithing to your church or more? Are you living with a bunch of debt and crippling to yourself and adding on to that? Are you generous or not? Are you open-handed or close-handed with how you live your financial life? Do you give, save, spend, or do you spend, 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 hopefully save, probably not give? Like, wh where are you at with that? I just hope that these tools will help you as an individual. I hope they'll help you as family. I hope they'll help you with your small groups to, think, to do those two things. Think about, do some real analysis of where you're building your life, and two, Get busy building on the rock. Take some steps of obedience. And here's the good news. Don't forget, this is good news. One, we know where the rock is. Two, we don't need no stinking building permits. And we got all the supplies we need. We are ready right now. It's time to build. Young people, get started now. Build your life on the rock-solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Older people, I can see how sometimes a message like this could be discouraging in a way. You could be like, well, I built, my, I built my house and now you're telling me it's on some sinking sand and I just wanna encourage you right now that the Jesus that we're talking about, he has the resurrection power to back up this question and this claim he makes on your life. He can, he can uh, you may need to do some demolition or he could just take your house and move it onto the rock or he can help you do the demolition and build something new way faster than you realize. Or he could put you in that little cabin on the, on the rock and give you contentment in your life. He can do this, so be encouraged, trust him. And then I just wanna say one more thing, build, we do this together. You don't build a house by yourself. Note that while there is an individual response required, these questions last week, this week, they're asked in the plural to the community. So do me one more favor today. Turn to somebody next to you and say, I will help you build your house on the rock. I don't feel like y'all said that like you meant it. Do it again. All right, and then here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray, 
We're going to sing, and we're going to walk out of here and do that. Let's pray. God of love, thank you for this day and this time together. Thank you for getting in our face with truth, but with love and grace. Thanks for challenging us to live what we say we believe. Help us, God, to trust and obey. Help us to be people, those of us who call you Lord, to, to just say Christ alone is the rock solid foundation of my life. And Lord, whether, whether we're in a building phase or a demolition phase or weathering some storm of life, Lord, bring us your peace, show your strength in our weakness and help us to be able to stand and say we built our lives on you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.